What separates growth companies from companies that don't grow? What do I know about growth? I was president of three fast growth companies over about a 15 year period. But for the last 10 years, I've done nothing but study what leads to sustainable, profitable growth. My definition of sustained growth is this, five years of 20% or greater. Five years, 20% or greater. If you're able to achieve that, then you have what I call a sustained growth company. There are seven areas in which growth companies concentrate their time, their money, and their effort. I'm not going to be telling you what to do today. It would be presumptuous of me, it would even be incorrect for me to tell you what to do to grow your businesses. Instead, what I'm going to be doing is suggesting that there are seven areas in which you look for the innovations, the evolutions that lead to the revolutions that lead to the next level that lead to growth. Let me ask you this. How many people here travel even 20 times a year by air? 20 times a year travel. Anybody? There we go. This, sir, would you agree with me? Prior to September 11th, it wasn't a lot of fun, but it was acceptable. After September 11th, it was more difficult. Would you agree? Would you agree in the last two years it's become even worse? Can we go so far as to say it was horrific in the last, is that true? For those who don't know, it's even worse now than ever before. But here's what I do. The only way I can survive a business travel day and keep a smile on my face is by keeping my eye on a prize. I have a prize at the end of every business travel day and there it is. It's a vanilla milkshake. I love vanilla milkshakes. Can you see it? I'm gonna get out of the way of it. Can you see it? I mean, I'm, look folks, I'm not, I'm not just talking about the milkshake. I'm talking, can you see this condensation? That's part of the visualization. Can you see how thick the, the, it, the, the straws are sticking up in the middle there? Big, thick, beautiful vanilla milkshake. I just visualize that prize when they say things to me like, I'm so sorry, sir, your flight's been canceled. That's okay, I'm sure there'll be another one. <laughs> see how that works? Now, it's been a particularly difficult day of planes, trains, and automobiles. I'm arriving into Baltimore, Maryland at midnight. I'm standing in a long taxi cab line, and eventually I get in the cab, and it takes me down to the Inner Harbor, and it's probably a 30, 45 minute drive, isn't it? So it's now about one in the morning. It's one in the morning, ladies and gentlemen. I got two bags on my shoulders. I show up at the hotel. There's a 30 minute wait to check in. Because everyone had been late to BWI that night due to weather problems. So I've got my two bags and I'm waiting and I'm waiting and eventually I get to the front desk and they give me one of those plastic keys. You know what I'm talking about? A plastic key? Okay. Room 809. With the two bags on my shoulders, I went to the elevator, pressed the eighth floor, get off on the eighth floor, went to room 809, took out my trusty key, put it in the door. It didn't work, did it? That is a 50-50 proposition in our country. So, I'm still smiling, I went downstairs, I got another key, I put the two bags on my shoulders, I went to the eighth floor, I went to room 809, I put it in the door, now this time it worked. This time it worked, and I pushed through. I went through, I didn't even put the bags down, I went straight over and I hit room service. This is an exact quote of what I heard on the other end of the line. Good evening, Mr. Little, this is Stuart in room service. What can I do to serve you? Quite the eager beaver for one in the morning. Would you agree? <laughs> but he was obviously polite. He was obviously well-trained. At this point in the transaction, I was relatively encouraged at this point. <laughs> I said, Stuart, I'd like a vanilla milkshake, please. Now, what did Stuart say to me? Right, we don't have vanilla milkshakes. I was crushed, right? But I regrouped. I knew he was my friend. He was been so nice to me. I said this, I said, Stuart, my friend, let me ask you this question. Do you have any vanilla ice cream in the kitchen tonight? Oh yes, Mr. Little, we've got ice cream. Would you like some? So yes, Stuart, I'd like a full bowl of vanilla ice cream. He said, yes, sir, right away, sir. Anything else I can do to serve you? I said, uh, yeah. You got any milk down there in the kitchen? 
You need milk, Stuart? He said, yes, Mr. Little, I've got milk. Would you like some? Yes, Stuart, I'd like a half full glass of milk in the tallest tumbler you have. Half full, Mr. Little? Half full, Stuart. Now, he thought that was an odd request, but he agreed to it. Anything else, Mr. Little, anything else at all I can do to serve you? Stuart, I'm going to need a long spoon to go with that. Now you think I'm making this up. Folks, I can't make stuff like this up, okay? <laughs> this is what happened. Five minutes later, five minutes later, there was a knock at the door, and there is a tray with a full bowl of ice cream, half a glass of milk, and a long spoon. Now I have a question for you. Perhaps you'll want to discuss it amongst yourselves. The question is this, is Stuart stupid? Is Stuart stupid? How many people think Stuart's stupid? Raise your hand. How many people think he's not stupid? Raise your hand. How many people think there's not enough information? Raise your hand. Because that might be the right answer. Look, everything I just told you is 100% true. It was Stuart. It was Baltimore. It was a little over a year and a half ago. I was cold, wet, tired, and hungry. And I was smiling. It's all true. I haven't told you the full truth. Full truth is this. I've run that experiment over the last five years, approximately 50 times a year, a total of 250 times, about 50 times a year. Now, it's not every night, because often, it's, like here, it's on the menu. So I don't call it in if it's not, if it's on the menu, I know it will do it. I test the system when it's not on the menu. And that's the point of the milkshake story. Remember, this is not a customer service story. Stuart wanted to do a good job. The milkshake rule says this. Stuart's not stupid. It's the system that's stupid. Don't let your systems make you stupid. With all the getting of technology, it should make us faster, cheaper, better, and smarter. Clearly, the most important thing you can do to grow your business is finding and keeping the best and the brightest. Finding and keeping the best and the brightest is where business growth leaders concentrate the most time, the most money, and the most effort. I am concerned that business growth leaders like you, they tend to see hiring, training, and retaining of the best and brightest as the thing that gets in the way of doing their real job. They got their real job over here. And then every once in a while, we got to go do this thing over here. And I'm here to tell you that this is your real job. This is your job. This is the job of a business growth leader. It isn't doing the thing. It's finding the best, brightest people to do the thing with and for you. And that transition is what leads to growth. 55 used to be old. I have a 16-year-old son, and he will see 75 the way you and I see 55. We're going to have 85-year-old workers you will have 85-year-old workers in your business, in your lifetime, and one of them will be you. Because <laughs> here's how it works. I see a lot of smiling 55-year-olds right now. It's kind of interesting. <laughs> here's how it works. A young person's dream, my, my definition of young has changed in recent years. My definition of young is less than 50. People under the age of 50's dream is to retire early. People over the age of 70's nightmare is to have nothing to do. And as a result, people are going to work well into their 80's, if not their 90's, because they'll have both the desire and the health to do it. And we're going to want them to because we got 7 million skilled workers already missing. We need people to work longer, and you're going to want to work longer. How does that affect this business and this industry? Remains to be seen. You want to see what 60 looks like, though, in our culture today? She is 61. Yeah. <laughs> Sir, you appear to be my, my, my age. 61 makes sense, right? Was her poster on your wall like it was on my wall as a teenager? I can do the math. Yeah. 61. She's looking good. Now, now what's this an ad for? Besides plastic surgery, what would this be an ad for? <laughs> Kmart. Yeah, Kmart. What does Kmart know that you need to know? 70%, 70, 70% 70 
of the discretionary spending in the United States, not Canada, United States, 70% is with people 50 plus. Let me say it another way. She got all the money. She has all the money. If you're 85 years old, she's an adolescent. Would you agree? She's coming out with a new TV show. It's incredible, the transformation. You want to see what 75, this one's for the women in the room today. We've got a lot of women here today. You want to see what 75 looks like in our culture now? Impossible 20 years ago. There he is. Sean. Women love Sean Connery. The original Bond, James Bond. And, and he was born in Edinburgh, Scotland. Edinburgh, Scotland. We're going to be talking about Edinburgh later. This man's 76 years old. He's a movie star. That didn't happen 20 years ago. That's how much our culture's changed. What you do matters. What you're doing matters. Business growth leaders in our nation matter. The business of America has always been business. Business growth leaders like you are the ones who make the right decisions every day that make the nation better, which makes the human condition better, because the United States of America is still the shining beacon on the hill that people look to throughout the world for hope, for direction, for freedom. You are the American dream. I got one last thing before I go, and that's this. In the speaking world, they have rules. Just like in your industry, you have rules and things that you're supposed to do, not supposed to do. One of the first rules I learned many years ago when I decided I was going to do this on a regular basis, one of the first rules I learned was never, ever end on a poem. So what do I do every day? I end on a poem. Here's how it goes. It says, perchance I come to a fair burg, and I do a bit of speaking, I take the time to look around. It's a hero I am seeking. And if I come to your hometown to launch my quest anew, remember, being simply better matters. Indeed, the hero could be you. It has been my honor and pleasure to be with you today. Good luck. Thank you.